What's up, ladies and gentlemen? This is the Truth Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Truth Seeker. Excited, delighted to be with you guys again for another podcast. Uh, we're pushing 300 episodes. That's a lot. Consistency is key. Talk to a lot of people, man, from all walks of life, ranging from spirituality, religious beliefs, the paranormal, uh, esoteric, all types of information. And I really feel like everybody has a piece of the puzzle, man. Some of these beautiful conversations that we had are embodied and embedded on the website and the different podcasting apps and stuff so make sure you go back and check out the back catalog of different people of eclectic beautiful minds and souls that we've interviewed on the sh- on the podcast it's uh it's been a been a fun ride been a wild ride been been really good uh for me i've learned a lot and that's the the, the cool thing is when you know i have guests on here and i'm able to learn from them and uh so i and i don't watch as many documentaries or or, or cram as much books as I used to. Uh, most of the the research that I'm getting in is uh, picking the the brain of of my guests on here who come on and have these conversations with me, and I'm able to take away so much. So I know that you guys are getting fed, and uh, the the inbox questions and emails and things like that after these episodes have just been phenomenal. Uh, the the way it's uh, these people are are helping you as well. And every again, everybody has a piece of the puzzle, bringing it to the table, putting it to the putting them together and it formulates a formulates a picture when we step back it's been beautiful um I want to say a huge thank you to everybody supporting my work uh, via Patreon. This is a listener-funded show. Listener support. It doesn't happen without your help. So a huge thank you from the bottom of my heart for believing in this podcast, believing in my work and what I bring to the table. Um, shout out to you guys. If you'd like to support, head on over to patreon.com backslash truth seeker there you get access to my entire discography of music which is 200 plus songs you get access to our thursday night school of the mystics which is our community aspect to what we're uh bringing to the table here we're doing that tonight so if you're looking for community man make sure you check that out you get access to that for as little as a dollar so make sure you check it out patreon.com backslash truth seeker also my new book is just three months old today uh spirit realm Angels, Demons, Spirits, and the Sovereignty of God, forward by jo- Jordan Maxwell. If you have not had a chance to pick up a copy of this, make sure you go get yourself a copy. Do yourself a favor. Go to uh, truthseeker.com. You can get it on Amazon, Walmart, uh, Barnes & Nobles, all those cool places where you uh, consume your literature. Make sure you check it out. It's on Kindle and Nook and all that stuff as well. So make sure you check it out. All right, so we're going to go ahead and jump into today's discussion today my guest is sarah main sarah welcome to the truth seeker podcast my friend how are you i'm very well thanks and thanks for having me along uh definitely uh looking forward to this interview and uh just looking up a bunch of your articles you guys sent me a copy of the book conscious confidence talking about the power of the sanskrit uh uh language or doorway or supernatural engaging of the words and vibrational tones and very interesting and I, I want to preface it this way this interview because I've done a lot of study coming from the Hebraic tradition and the power of the Hebrew and the forgotten language there and so um, 
and, and it's very powerful, right? I think all languages really are magical and powerful. And it comes back to going back to the ancient language and the dialect and the tones and the power to create with the words. And so I've been a student of that school of thought from the Hebraic language. So uh, jumping into the Sanskrit, uh, I've, I've just encountered doing chants and mantras and things like that. Some of the dialect and uh, what well, we just did the um, what was it? Um, Ramadasa chant this past weekend and everybody said just by chanting these words and tapping into the universal energy it was just such a, a beautiful experience so I'm looking to uh, to dive into the Sanskrit today <laughs> it's a great intro and um, yeah we're, you're right on the, the, the wavelength that I'm on in terms of tapping into the power and the wisdom I went into the etymology as well because that's part of my training into the wisdom and there's incredible powerful energy and knowledge in the Sanskrit words and um, and that's uncovered a whole lot of knowledge and practical wisdom about how to actually evolve what came to me and I didn't think these words up it came to me but I call conscious confidence and I've just followed what came that's awesome uh before we jump really deep into that because I know it's going to get really deep really quick just kind of give an (laughs) overview about your background where you are and what you bring to the table just kind of introduce yourself to uh people who is just their first time um hearing about you Okay, thanks. I'm in Sydney, Australia. I'm born and bred Australian. Uh, My parents were from England, but I grew up in Sydney. Um, And from an early age, uh, I got interested in philosophical things because my parents were interested and they were really seeking themselves and they started studying philosophy in classes, philosophy classes, but philosophy that was practical, how to apply it in everyday life, philosophy that was transformative not theoretical and there was also meditation and also some Sanskrit and I was 10 years old and I got interested because they were excited about what they were learning this was back in the late 1960s and um, so at the age of 10 1971 I started philosophy classes with them and it went from there I just loved it I didn't always understand everything as a kid, but as I got older, I did. Loved the meditation, just loved everything. And, of course, when I got to Sanskrit, that that was me. I loved it. So I studied that at university as well. And and then I taught it. I've taught it for years. Um, and so that's really my, my background. I've also been an executive coach. I was a school teacher for 30 years, teaching philosophy and meditation and, and normal maths and English and stuff. And... Um, and then uh, I then retrained and became an executive and transformational coach. And that's led me to doing, bringing the two together now with conscious confidence. Yeah, that's awesome. Because I was going to, I was going to ask you, like, it seems like they go together, right? The, the spirituality, the meditation, and then the deep love for this magical, mystical language, if you will. And so, and, yeah. and, the, and the fact that you said that this uh, transformational, maybe even personal a philosophy teaching versus theory you know there's kind of a a level i think many of us get into it and it's theory and it's debate and it's doctrinal and that kind of thing and uh but but we we quickly learn that if it doesn't it, if it doesn't have a transformational power for us today like how can i apply this to my life today then it's really of no service to us you know and so there's a lot of people um uh in in these movements now that are growing spirituality and they want to do the you know the inner work inner healing and, and focusing all these different modalities and things that they can and apply to their life and learn to help them become a better person, uh, attract the things that they want in, in life. And, uh, and there's a, a lot of different ways to do it. And the, the spoken word and the written word is definitely something that comes up a lot. Uh, the life, uh, life and death is in the power of the tongue and those type of things. Is that something that is taught from the, the Sanskrit uh, tradition as well, or like the, the uh, b- being able to create as you speak, if you will, or the vibration of frequencies within words? Abs- absolutely, Shabda Brahman. It's um, our our whole life, our whole existence is literally spoken into existence by the the formulation of the thoughts we think and the words we speak. We're speaking the whole experience into existence as we go along, and that's really through my training where 
we were taught to look very carefully back to what, well, going back to a source language like Sanskrit, what does the Sanskrit say about something? Uh, to uncover any sort of limits that we have in our own thinking and belief system. And sort of once you sort of sweep away some of the limits and you get to a more universal knowledge and wisdom, that then changes your speech, your thoughts, everything. So I just applied that to the area of developing a proper connection with yourself um, and overcoming what I saw initially was performance anxiety in musicians, but then it's led to a fundamental confidence in yourself. And so I, how, how um, as far as these modalities and things like that have been like <clears throat> engaging the language, what is like the, the practical way for somebody who is just getting into your work? Is it is it by engaging through chants and mantras? Is it through reading and actually learning the language and the dialect and things like that? Look, you could do all of that. It depends. It really depends what you want. The chanting is amazing straight away mm -hmm. um, because the language is so powerful. The word sans we say Sanskrit, which is really a Hindi pronunciation. The actual word is Sanskrita. Um, and the word Sanskrita means pure and perfectly formed. And that's because the, the knowledge, the energy, the wisdom is pure and perfectly formed. It's intact. It hasn't been diluted. Um, so you chant any Sanskrit chant simply, like the Gayatri Mantra, which is Asatoma, Sadgamaya. If you, if you chant that, it's powerful and it's transformative. There's no doubt about that. Um, I've gone down the route of etymology, which is to – just words like attitude that we use all the time. But if you go back to what the Sanskrit says about it and reconsider it from that point of view, that vibration of the energy in the language, opening up our um, mind and heart that way, and so then that can affect how you live your life. So my book, for example, has got practices at the end of each chapter, things you can actually do to put this into practice, and the transformation is in that. I, I suppose I didn't expect people to go and learn a whole lot of Sanskrit when I wrote the book. They could. <laughs> I think that would be awesome, but I'm not expecting people to do that. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I mean, you know, going back to the chanting, I mean, that's the way I've learned some of these words, just through the chanting and, and actually yeah. looking up, you know, what it means in English. And I resonate with the English pronunciation, so I feel good of, you know, there's a, there's a connection there versus yeah. chanting something I have no idea what it means, you know, those kind of things. And uh, and, and, yeah. and I'm, I'm able to learn it that way is through the chanting, which has been something that's been really cool. Yes, and, and what you did about actually going back and finding out what you're saying, it's so that's so important. And that was one of the roots through my training um, and teaching was you need, you need to know what you're saying. So going back to what the, the deeper Sanskrit derivation is and the meaning so that when you do chant, it's, it's meaningful yeah. and, and not just parroting <laughs> sounds, which have a lovely feeling to them, yeah. but it, it's the whole thing. Now I'm I'm gonna go far left here on you just to see if there's any correlation there because like there's a, in this Christian mystical movement that that we're a part of there's this new idea and I think it's a very ancient idea but it's coming back and so there's a lot of people engaging with the Hebrew letters not the words but the letters themselves yes. as yeah. being a mystical experience as being alive like each letter that is alive and when they come together to formulate a word it brings something but you can break the words down even to the letter to get a deeper meaning of the etymology mm. of where these words came from. Is there any connection there? Is that an, 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 an idea that's to be looked into with the Sanskrit as well? Look, it could vary. It's, it, it's not something the individual letters is not something, uh, and I'm familiar with it, it with Hebrew, but um, – it's not something I've specifically done with Sanskrit down to individual letters in words. Just the words themselves are so p uh, potent. You take the word like shanti, which means peace. Yeah. Um, and as you say, the, the actual experience of peace goes with the word, whereas we're used to say in English uh, – we say the word peace and then we have a conceptual meaning in our heads up here of peace, <laughs> right? 
Yeah. And to have the two things go together, that's languages like Hebrew or Sanskrit, they have the whole thing together. So when you say Shanti, that's the effect it has at that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, and and I think there's a beauty in all the languages, especially peace. You know, of of, of shalom, yeah. of peace, of shanti, yeah. om shanti, shanti. I remember putting that into. So I'm I'm introducing a lot of new uh, Western Christians, if you will, to some of the Eastern thought. And so even in my music, there's just some little om shanti, shanti here and uh, that that kind of stuff. And people hear it and they 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 they. they a lot of them, when it's new for the first time, they're kind of caught off guard. Like, what do you mean? What does that mean? <laughs> that this, this chant? And I'm like, it means peace. I'm speaking peace over you through the through the music. And so, in the form of yeah. prayers and things like that, and, uh, and and music and vibrational, it's beautiful and it's transformational. But uh, just speaking peace over yourself in in the form of meditation and uh, Om Shanti Shanti Om Shanti Shanti, and it's just it's so beautiful. And as you speak it you're creating it you're releasing it you're engaging with maybe even the spirit of peace that that kind of shows up once you once you call upon it and so it's been it's been so beautiful for me and uh and and really uh shows you the power of the words versus speaking death or speaking something else speaking peace speaking life bliss and all of these different ancient words that are kind of connected with it as well yeah definitely yeah, yeah now, absolutely. As far as um, um, Sanskrit being a universal language, and for me, I think the universal language, as far as like when we break it down even deeper, it's, it almost seems like sacred geometry or, you know, yeah. when, when you uh, break down the, the sound and the vibration of a word, it form, formulates a picture, if you will. So for me, that's like everything is everything's moving, everything's vibrating. And that's what it looks like, right? If you took a picture of it or, or in time or water ripples and things like that, we kind of get to see the vibration. How does Sanskrit go back to, to, to being the uh, universal language? Um. Well, I would say there's like Sanskrit and there's Sanskrit because there's Sanskrit, the language with all the the millions of texts and they're, they're on all subjects like medicine and, and science and uh, um, astronomy and architecture. It's not just philosophical things. Sanskrit covers everything. Um, and then it goes back to the actual meaning and vibration and then you go, you transcend that to um, when we're still, say, in meditation or we become quiet or in prayer and we hear that inner still small voice, that voice is always exactly pure and perfectly formed. And that's what Sanskrit means. It's pure and perfectly formed to exactly what you need to know in that moment. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. It'll never put you wrong. You know, it can be described as the word of God. Well, so it, the, the Sanskrit language is like it best reflects that in a language you can recognize. It's... Um, Hard to put it into words, but it is like a beautiful reflection, a perfect reflection of that inner voice. Uh, and it connects you with the, the universal and the limitless to the here and now. Um, so let me just throw this in there just because there's a question in chat already. We got a lot of people listening live right now. Um, somebody's just kind of catching this, uh, just jumping in, and they want to know, is are we talking about Hinduism? Is this Hinduism, or is it what, 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 what is this that we're talking about? Well, Sanskrit is a, an ancient Indian language. There's, you know, that's known. Um, but there is a universality in the meaning, and that's what I've endeavoured to bring out. It, it, yes, Sanskrit is integral to the Hindu langu- uh, religion, no doubt about that. But the wisdom itself is universal. It wouldn't matter what background. And that's what I've tried to bring out in drawing on the, what the Sanskrit says about key things like values, attitude. Um, you know, there's all sorts of areas like that. Balance, your inner balance and alignment of your body, mind, heart and spirit. What does the Sanskrit say about that? Because everyone's talking about alignment these days of body, mind and heart. Great. What does Sanskrit say about that? Just go back and find out what the meaning is there. And the knowledge is universal. It's not yeah. Hindu. It's not from Judaism. It's not Christian. It's <laughs> universal. Exactly. And, and therefore, it's applicable to whatever your path. Yep. 
that's the beautiful thing. It's kind of like, you know, you're really helping people transcend those religious barriers. Like, oh, this is a Hindu conversation. Yeah. No, no, no. This is this is yeah. not a uh, uh, Hinduism is a religion. This isn't a religious thought. This is a you know the etym- the universal language tongue, the etymology of words, and uh, and actually yeah. breaking down because words have power. And and they all do. all religions kind of teach something very similar. And so where does that power come? It comes from it comes from the origin of the word, which is the vibrational sound and the idea that is embodied through words, right? The uh, yeah. you know the the, the thoughts and, and things like that. And it was interesting that where you you were talking about how uh, you have the thoughts, right? But then the thoughts are kind of they have to connect with the heart and then connect with the breath and formulate the words to create it. So there's like this co-creation that goes on with uh, the body, the ideas. And once you speak it out, then you're creating and you're manifesting these things into your life. But it has to come from that vibration. So it's almost like our vocal cords are vibrating, tongues are formulating, mouth is formulating and, and phrasing these words. But they're ideas and things that we're kind of like sending out. We have an yeah. idea. And we send it out through words, whether it's life or death or and we're in and, and subconsciously without even knowing it, we're creating our life. And actually, by default, we're, we're like master manifestors. We're all really good at it, but, but, yeah. but we don't even know it until we kind of do these studies and, and find out that we're co-creators with the divine creating creating the life that we want for ourselves. Yeah, absolutely, and that's extremely well described, the whole process. And the fact that that is happening, that's how we are made in, in you know, the design is that we are these co-creators. Uh, it makes sense that we should uh, actually be a little bit more aware of what we're creating because with the, the mind and the heart, with the, the formulation of the thought, then the feelings come along and then our speech, and then our actions, and then we enact it. And, you know, let's hope it's conscious rather than, as you say, by default, which is a scary prospect, actually. Um, you know, look, it was really interesting when I was doing a lot of research and I, I, you know, the word attitude, now that's a common word, right? I went around about 50 people and just said, quick, without thinking, if I say the word attitude, what's your response? And absolutely 99.9% of the people I asked said their attitude to the concept of attitude was negative, right? And they're just carrying that around without even realizing it, that they have this negative response to the word attitude. Mm. Um, and they associate it with like bad attitude yeah, in a negative teenager. You know. <laughs> so I went back to what the Sanskrit says about attitude. And it's anything but negative. And it's extremely powerful. Yeah, that's and, awesome. Know, at- Attitude covers and colors our whole existence. It's the lens through which we see the world and through which we act and speak. So it'd be quite good if we were aware of our attitude. <laughs> you know? I like I, I like to tie uh, attitude in with gratitude. I mean, it rhymes and, uh, you know, yeah. have an attitude of gratitude and your attitude determines your altitude, how high that you're vibing, the type of life that you're creating for yourself. And I think it does come back to attitude, but you're right. When we hear it, there's a bunch of those words. Even yeah. the word Sanskrit for, for somebody who was religious was like, hey, is this is this Hinduism? Is this promoting yeah. other other ideas or, or religions? It's like, hold on. it's it, it's You have to look into it. And so using a lot of these words. And so there's so many uh, that we have in in. in in the um, English that come from a lot of these different ancient languages, the Latin, the Greek, the Hebrew, Sanskrit, all of them. And it, we kind of yeah. formulate this magical language that we have now. I really do believe that the the English language language is a magical language. I mean, all languages really, um, but really working past some of the stigmas that we have. As soon as we hear a word, we yeah. throw up red flags. And again, attitude being, being one of them, but going back to the origin of the word and what it really means is, it's not something that's negative or something you should be afraid of or something, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. In fact, we've been speaking English now for, you know, 20, 25 minutes or something. And we've, there've been tons of, we're completely connected to Sanskrit because English is pulling all those connections from Sanskrit and Latin and Greek have pulled from Sanskrit. So, you know, 
it, it isn't Hindu, it, it is universal in that way and it's all about the meaning. So you just take the word attitude or values or balance, anything like that. I'm just picking a few words that are out of the, in the book and there's, yeah. not a, there's not a huge pile of Sanskrit but the focus is going back to what it says and then going back to your tradition and mm-hmm. enlivening that and enriching that with some new knowledge. Yeah. For sure. Um, now, where does um, mindfulness and meditation come into this? And I know we're talking about manifestation. For me, it all it all ties in together. It, for me, it's all mm. one and the same. Like you can't have one without the other. This whole being mindful to to actually manifest this your your life and your destiny and using words to do that. But where does yeah. mindfulness and meditation come into it for you? Of I mean, there's so many different types of meditation. There's so many different ways to meditate, guided meditations, meditating upon, you know, our days and what, what we want to do, what we want to create. For you, where, where does it come in at? Uh, well, it's, I can answer that in so many ways. I was introduced to meditation when I was 10. So I actually, and I'm a bit older than 10 now, so I actually don't remember a time in my life where I didn't meditate. It's just like, living, breathing for me. But um, meditation is a key and mindfulness. They, they do go together <clears throat> because it's about being present here and now because you're talking about uh, manifesting by default. Um, and the thing about meditation and mindfulness is to come into the present moment. So it's deliberate. Living is deliberate and conscious and uh, You know, I actually discuss this about conscious versus unconscious and what the Sanskrit says about both. Because most of the time we think of conscious like you're walking along and you're awake enough not to walk into a tree, okay? But there's actually a little bit more to it than that. Um, And you, you need some knowledge, you need to be present, and you need to actually shift some of your, uh, you know, subconscious beliefs that keep you limited and keep you unconscious. You need to basically wake up, <laughs> uh, you know. You need to have an awakening. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that, that doesn't mean you're kind of spaced out, but yeah. you actually need to lift your level of consciousness and awareness. And, you know, meditation is the master key. It's described as the master key that opens all doors. I was introduced to mantra meditation, but – you know, also practice mindfulness, awareness. I mean, when I was learning meditation, the word mindfulness didn't even exist. It's a kind of thing that's mm-hmm. happened in the last 20 years. Yeah. But awareness and things, that's for all time. It's universal. Do you it's think just got that, a different name. <laughs> do you think that another good name for it or just another good way to describe it is simply being intentional with your words, yeah. being intentional with your meditation, being intentional with your c- conscious and unconscious subconscious thoughts you know being intentional so we know that you know that it, everything is is working for us to create this life that we want and again to wake up and to uh cast off those limiting beliefs that we first of all we have to you know we have to uh, i guess agree or, or come to the knowledge that there are some things that have kind of held us back or we you know, created by default. And there's a lot of people don't even know that, you know, so just being intentional and knowing it and, and uh, being conscious or mindful, if you will, of uh, the now moment, I think it's a a good way to describe it. Just being intentional with our conversations. Even I talk about that being intentional with your conversations too. Yeah, absolutely. But to be intentional, we've actually got to be here present. Mm. So we have, you know, not with one ear listening to thoughts in our head and and then just sort of half an ear listening to a conversation, but to actually be fully present, listening with both your ears and then intentional, say, um, to speak with respect to someone, to speak with kindness, to act you know, you actually need to be present. Otherwise, there are, we have quite a lot of habits and we can just go to sleep and the habits will kick in. Now, if we've been brought up to be respectful, hopefully that's our kind of base level, for example. But if I wanted to be um, conscious and intentional enough to be awake as I walk from this desk to the door behind me, right, and actually feel my feet as they're touching the ground, I've got to be intentional and awake enough to 
stay with each foot as it touches the floor. But it's so easy to just drift off and think about where I'm going or our conversation that we've just had or something like that. So it takes an effort of intent and a decision to be present. And that's one of the key things in meditation is to be an in, a decision and an intent to stay present, uh, whether you're chanting or it's a mantra or just being aware. And I know that um, and it, this sounds, you know, so mystical and I, I love the fact that it does. And it's you can keep going and you can keep kind of holding like a uh, magnifying glass to it and get deeper and deeper and deeper into the mystical means of it. But it comes yeah. back to practicality. So we're kind of like all this manifestation. We're talking about being mindful. It's like making good decisions, you know, yeah. being conscious of the decisions that you're making, being intentional again with your words and and ideas and how you spend your time, you know, all that kind of stuff, taking it back and uh, creating the life that you want for yourself but when it comes to and, and so that just kind of happens by default it's something very physical it's very something very natural that everyone is doing right it, whether you know it or yeah. not um yeah. but when it gets into the myst mystical a little bit have you done any study or any research when it comes to talking about uh, manifestation and timing like how long certain <laughs> things take or processes start and you know I, I, I truly believe in in this whole thing but i know there's a process and seed time and harvest and you have to plant mm. seeds and you have to water them and you have to cultivate the land and make and, and pull the pull the weeds out and for for something to to take root and grow is there any anything that you've you've done or or had these revelations of of where time exists there with this manifestation process or am, I, or, or am I making it sound too mystical because it's very practical? You know? It is. It, it is practical. Uh, look, every moment is universal. There, there isn't universal somewhere else and then I'm here. It is universal every moment. Whether we appreciate that or not is depends on our level of awakefulness or consciousness or, um, or intent. There, there's several ways to answer that because the, there is a time element, so to speak, uh, and it's like a, you know, you have an egg and and then you get a chicken. So like 20 days, or how is it, yeah. 21 days or something, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and an elephant is takes like a year, 12 months or something. So there, on one level, there is a time element, so to speak. And yet at the same time, in terms of manifestation, we can be here right now with something that we want to manifest that appears not to be present in our sensory experience. We can actually still be present with that thing that we want to uh, manifest, even though the senses will deny that we can still be present with it. Wow. And then it seems like some period of time elapses and then it manifests. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, a challenge for us as human beings um, to learn the art of patient presence, <laughs> right, yeah. until it's like the sensory world catches up. And that's part of the rub we think well it's not working because it's not here now well it is actually here now but we're so hooked on our sensory experience that we want it boom, straight away yeah. and sometimes it is basically immediate sort of in sanskrit so has to malika held your hand out there it is um and in other cases it appears like some time elapses and i think that's illusory basically yeah. um if you're in, if you're genuinely in the present moment, you're unconcerned about the past and the future. The present is the present, um, and that's not some sort of hyper present thing where I've got to have it now. It's your present, and the presence. There's peace in the presence, and there's patience in the presence. But Sanskrit also, in the in the wisdom traditions held in Sanskrit, there's a whole description of the process. It's called the seven steps. Wow. And it starts from the beginning and it actually goes through these, the sort of inspiration or idea for something new through the actual steps of manifestation. It doesn't put a time limit on it, but there is actually a process of manifestation. It's a journey and it's laid out in seven steps. And that applies to complete spiritual transformation of an individual into the universal, the divine. Or it's if you wanted to make build a chair, it's yeah. the same process of manifestation. That's awesome. 
because I'm just getting like, like in in deep in deep levels of uh, meditation and bliss and religious experience and really kind of going to God for this understanding of wanting to become something and how long is it going to take and just being able to see these versions of yourself that are kind of down the road. Um, yeah. It was it was communicated with me that it's not something that I'm going to become. It's something that I already am. And it's so yeah. just the, the, the process to manifest it, uh, it's going to be different. And, and so and, and I remember I wrote about it in my book, but it seemed like something that would take years to kind of embody or become. It's like, no, you're not becoming. You already are. Let me show yeah. you how you already are in these different waves of revelation that came to me. And um, something that seemed like it was going to take years or months took weeks to really uh, embody in my life. And, and I already was that. And for it to come out, I think it was like an idea of me knowing of me, like finally, Oh, okay. It's not something outside of myself that I'm seeking to become or to mimic or to whatever, but it's, I'm just learned this process of manifesting what is already within me. And it was, it's, it's been given to me as an inheritance, these feelings and ideas for a reason. And so it's awesome that you say that. Cause like, you can think of some of the the time, the, the seven steps um, of maybe being a, a term of seven years for some certain things for, for you to manifest yeah. and to kind of step into. Yeah. Uh, but maybe maybe you go through those seven steps in a span of seven minutes for some yeah. things to become yeah. consciously aware of it, manifest it and go through these steps until it, like it's here. Because we've all yeah. seen that, right? We've had these strange synchronicities happen in our lives and phone calls and people that we're thinking about call us and just things kind of rearranging in our life, this manifestation process almost like sped up and cert- at certain times. It's very strange to think about, but it's it's awesome. Yeah. And and if you're really present with that which you are, as you say, you, you already are it. Um, my father used to say that you already are it. You already are that which you seek. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, it's, it's really a case of waking up or realizing it more than becoming or, or, you know, changing from one thing to another. And in that process of awakening or realization, um, yeah, if you're genuinely fully present at each moment with it, uh, then you're unconcerned about this sort of so-called sense of time. It's a curious thing. We can The mind can flip between the two, and it's a, the real thing is to stay awake and, and awake and aware and present with it, I think. Mm-hmm. That's my experience anyway, yeah. Yeah, because when you're not, it just seems to be f- fleeting. And it, it, th- yeah. there's these weird places that we get, so we, we feel like we're in the flow everything's lining up against synchronicities and phone calls and numbers and all of these things are just lining up like wow life is magical and then something will happen that kind of rocks you and and kicks you off the path for a moment and you're like wow how do I get back to that place that I was where manifestation was happening where I was comfortable in my skin where I was you know I felt spiritual you know that kind of thing and so we want to get back on the on the path but it's like this simple thing of like just aligning our vibrations again not for something outside of ourselves to for the universe to come to us but really dialing in our own frequencies to align ourselves with that which already is and it's a weird idea because we're taught that we need something outside of ourselves or even like god is going to show up or angels will come to you like all of this stuff exists and already is it's about you tuning your frequency to align to that stuff and receive it into your life and be like a good, uh, you know, ground for those things to to grow, you know, in your life. It, yeah. it already is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, it, it's a good description. It, it, it's just opening up the channels and it is already here or here now, basically. And it's a case of the the clearer you can be. That's That's what I found so powerful in studying Sanskrit. And when I was introduced to being able to go back to the wisdom itself, it was just a way of, of clearing out blockages um, to my understanding of things because the, the potency of the wisdom in Sanskrit is universal and it just sort of, it's like sort of putting everything through a washing cycle or something, I don't know. And you suddenly think, ah, oh, I thought it was this, but it's this. And it, it's far more whole and universal and complete 
um, and it's not limited. And it just shines a light on those limits. And that's wonderful. I think when you said something happens to sort of throw us off our point of centre, mm-hmm. um, I think one of the things about reestablishing that connection again is to embrace the so-called challenges that come without resistance, but actually embracing them, welcoming them, um, the, the attitude of gratitude, saying thank you, because uh, they always lead, if we do it that way, then the so-called challenges do lead to greater awakening, greater, greater realisation and awareness. But if we resist them and see them as a problem, then already we've got blocks, uh, which always end up creating more problems, basically. Um, there's a lot of debate and a lot of different ideas. I want to see if you've looked into it at all when it comes to the original sound, like the first sound that was spoken at the beginning that people want to know because you can engage with it, the sound that, that you can chant even. For me, I, I've heard a lot of people say it's the ohm sound and that's a beautiful thing to chant. But there's also this this hue or, or who sound. I don't know if you've done any study on that. Have you looked into like the original sound that's that's uh in, in in those different traditions that's believed um not in a lot of different traditions but i was certainly taught that om is the primordial sound the mm-hmm. original sound and that actually going back to an earlier question about individual letters uh the sanskrit's made up of uh, the om is made up of a uh, and u uh, which form o and then the m mm sound halantama and um each of those sounds it does have a specific uh, vibration meaning, as it were. Um, but I think it's important to understand that the meanings also are beyond just our normal conceptual understanding of meaning. Um, they're very much an experiential meaning, and that's of a different level. Um, so I was taught OM, um, and that is the primordial sound from which everything manifests. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know it's reflected in different traditions. Have you, have you heard of the who or the or the hue sound at all? Have you looked? Uh, have you heard? I haven't looked into it. I've heard of yeah. it. I think that's probably the only thing I can say. Yeah. Sure. Cool, cool. What are some of the different other uh, key principles that you've uh, applied in your your teaching career? That other other than you know, I know we got we got these now, but are there any other other things that are like really near and dear to your heart that you do? Like even with meditation, is there like breath work before you know things like that? <laughs> Um, well, certainly before sort of starting the formal part of meditation, as it were, um, coming into the present moment, connecting with breath is very uh, simple and powerful because it, it connects you to the, the present moment. You know, we don't breathe in the past or the future. We breathe in the present. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the, the graces of the physical body is that it does actually anchor you basically here and now. So that's handy. Um, but... I think there's – when I in my teaching career, uh, which was so – you know, teaching's challenging. There's no doubt about it. I was a teacher for 30 years. Um, there were some incredible moments, uh, and it was a very privileged position to, to work with young people and, and also their parents, for that matter. Um, but the image that we uh, – what I was taught, actually, was to see each child – as the supreme universal uh, self, if you like, or a, a manifestation of the divine, see each child as the manifestation of the divine every single day. And I was given that as a discipline to practice. And that was profound because there's some days you didn't feel like it, yeah. There were some kids that were being naughty and you just didn't think that they were particularly divine at the time. And it didn't mean you had to – you could ignore their behaviour, but you understood the behaviour was there and yet underneath they were a manifestation of the universal divine force. And that just meant that you connected with the child at a whole different level and their parents and your colleagues at school – and um, that just sort of added this whole extra dimension to everything you had to do every day. And, and that was profound. And, and as you could tell, I carry that with me to this day. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And, and so, like, you, you always hear, like, um, if 
these these deep crazy truths or whatever like if you can't in doctrines and belief systems if you can't explain them to a child and they're not practical for a child to get then you might want to reevaluate it and and it's yeah. so many times that even spirituality and spiritual practice gets so far out that it's like you know what's it gonna like you need to see the end result like how can we apply this to our lives how can we make this real for today you know whether it's chasing conspiracy theories or just doctrines or or ideas again you know knowledge and 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 uh and and and, and research kind of it, it tends to kind of puff one up to make one arrogant but uh yeah. it, it should be simple that that you can share it with anybody right and so you learned it as a kid right you learned how to tap into this at 10 years old and it's for everyone yeah. right it's not just for the deep initiated like you know person doing the inner work it should be something for everybody oh, oh deep and initiated god forbid that, you know? <laughs> i mean some people think oh, that though some people they think do. that yeah yep 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 nah, look it you're spot on if you can it, if you can't explain this to a five-year-old, then you don't know it well enough because the essence is always simple. Complex doesn't help anybody, basically. Um, and one of the chapters in my book is on simplifying, and the Sanskrit tells you about this because if if things aren't simple, then it's clouded over and, and that's where the doubt and confusion comes in. And um, fundamental connection with yourself isn't available when you when there's doubt and confusion. So you need you need to get to the essence. And in fact, um, this is in the wisdom traditions in Sanskrit. They used to celebrate. They said <laughs> they said if 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 one of the sages could shorten a syllable in one of the um, writings or or spoken tradition by half a syllable if they could simplify it down into a more essential form by even half a syllable that was cause for the greatest celebration like you'd had a child that was born into the family <laughs> right because you had let go of and stripped away something that was unnecessary to the absolute essence and that was one thing about teaching young children um, when they were young you had to get to the absolute essence. And that didn't mean dumbing it down. That means getting down to the essence. And if you get it to the essence, a child can understand easily. You know, um, it's we adults that get stupid. That's funny you say that. <laughs> you know, coming from the Christian tradition, it's like, you know, Jesus says, in order to inherit the kingdom of heaven, you need to become like these little children. They're very uh, believing. They're carefree. You know, they, they're not yep. easily... Uh, drawn away by the things that really, you know, we think matter. They kind of know what, what what matters and things like that. So really going back to the childlike heart, childlike faith even to embrace this stuff. And it's been like a, uh, you know, read The Alchemist and things like that. It's like this uh, journey of going, getting back to our our childhood self that we've uh, been told yeah. that we had to grow up. And you find there's a lot of people having challenges as they're stepping into adulthood, right? What are, what are some of the challenges that you've uh, seen people uh, having, especially working with clients one-on-one? -on -one? Um, yeah, good question. Um, uh, overcoming doubt and confusion and lack of clarity is probably number one. And the causes of that, you know, that, that is individual to the person, of course, but um, the main thing is a lack of really, and this is what led me to do what I'm doing now, is a lack of sort of knowledge that's actually useful and dependable and has stood the test of time. Um, if you haven't been taught anything really uh, of any wisdom or knowledge, then you actually don't have a lot. You've only just got good instincts, maybe a bit of what you learned from your parents, and you're just kind of making it up as you go along. Um, and to come back and say, well, the wisdom tradition says this, and they go, oh, I didn't know that, you know. And so you actually need some proper knowledge or wisdom, and scripture's good for that, uh, wisdom traditions, you know, you need some new knowledge, in other, in other words. So that, that helps. Um, I've found uh, getting out of alignment, the sort of lack of, Balance in body, mind, and heart and spirit is a big one for the clients that I work with. Uh, you know, too much thinking, blocked in their emotions, overworking, and just getting 
completely out of alignment. They just lose connection with life, the joy of living, the love of their family, the the joy of the present moment. And so coming back and getting into alignment, so there's a, a line of energy, that's a big one. Um, achieving some sort of, you know, people talk about life, work, balance. Well, basically that, but actually I take body, mind, heart and spirit getting into alignment again. Yeah. I, you're talking about, um, you know, doing the proper research, having a prop, proper knowledge and things like that. I, I think it really helps for a framework of, how like different maybe tools that we can use to operate and just understanding that someone did it before us and it's a it's a thing but do, are you finding that like some people are having a hard idea a hard time because of the analytical mind like they want to have it all figured out before <laughs> they really step into this like they want to have the background they want to have proof but in, to to the degree where it's working against them yeah absolutely yeah, yeah the, the analytical mind is basically one of the chief barriers. Um, but that said, I think, and, and this is something I would say with sort of all the mindfulness stuff that's around, and it's great, but then the mind can be seen as um, a bit of a baddie or an enemy because it because of all this over-analysis. And the mind isn't a, the enemy. It's just been allowed to run the show because we've been asleep. <laughs> So when we become present, the mind's used to being in charge and we say, hang on a minute, I'm here now, I'm present, just wait a minute. Because the mind has its places. I mean, you know, the, all these developments of technology are the product of people applying their minds to issues. Um, so the mind is a magnificent tool, but it, it's a tool rather than something that needs to run the show. And um I think that's where we just need to train the mind to actually be present, pay attention, and, and that takes a bit of work and knowledge and practice. Um, and to, to then use the mind well as a tool rather than be used by it, I think that's probably one way of saying it. Um, what is the uh, conscious co confidence in the, uh, the, the, the FUSE program? Is it a little bit of everything what we've been talking about <laughs> so far? Yeah. Yeah, the the Conscious Confidence Fuse program, um, there's six parts to it. There's um, looking into your values, what's important, the most important to your core values. You need to get back to that because that's one of your first obvious connections with yourself. Then attitude, and I talked about it a lot today because attitude is the lens through which we see the world. So think of a glass of water. If you put one drop of ink in that, then the whole glass is coloured by that drop of ink. Well, that's like attitude. Depending on what's in our attitude, that will colour everything we see, whether we're aware of it or not. So values, attitude, and then the fuse part comes from focusing, uniting, simplifying and energizing so conscious confidence comes from focusing our attention being able to pay attention not be distracted uniting being in line with ourselves and not divided within ourselves and with other people simplifying letting go of the unnecessary and energizing which is then being able to act with enthusiasm and energy and purpose and creativity and clarity so all of that is an experience of conscious confidence so it's really it's really combating you know the default which for some people if for conscious confidence to be something that's a thing or to be true then it's kind of co combating the unconscious doubt right or the un unconscious uh you know unconfident you know, which yeah. is a lot, how a lot of us are, are walking and we don't even know it because it's like we're used to it, you know, yeah. but there, there is something else that you are, again, co-creators with God, um, creating this life for yourself. And there's different ways to do it. It's working for some people and it's becoming more popular. I really do think that like, you know, thank and grow rich and a lot of these these people who are like behind the secret and Abraham Hicks, I think they're borrowing a lot of stuff from the Eastern traditions and from Sanskrit and some of these universal principles that are not privy to any religion or any set or group of people. Some people have a great way of uh, bringing it out and, and different ways of describing it, but it's becoming more popular now. It's becoming more mainstream and 
people like Russell Brand even teaching kundalini yoga and different Sanskrit <laughs> mantras and things like that that raise your vibration and help you feel better and uh, connecting yeah. with, with what we call God or the infinite source of power and wisdom. And it's becoming more more po- uh, popular and, and um, mainstream now. How is that? Is that uh, it's been something to help you? Have you noticed that there's a lot more people talking about it than when you first got into this? Uh, because I know there was a boom of it back then, but maybe it's because we have the internet now, but maybe it's just my friends or whatever, just the circles that I'm in. I mean, that's my <laughs> conscious. I'm only conscious of the people talking about it, but I know there's a boom in this stuff, right? I, I definitely uh, yeah. yeah, definitely. Look, in nine, when my parents started, they had to really look, right? This was back in the late 1960s in Sydney, Australia, right? They'd come out from England after World War II. There wasn't anything, right? And they they were really looking and they found things, but it was not mainstream. Like the internet didn't exist. You had to go to a bookshop, specific bookshops, find certain books, read the books, right? There were no podcasts or anything. <laughs> okay. And then when I when I started in 1971, it's the same. And not and no one really talked about it. You had to go and find the right people to talk about this stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was seen as a bit sort of yeah. I know, spooky, but it yeah. wasn't because people were really looking into the, the science of consciousness and uncovering this stuff and connecting with this ancient wisdom. And I like to think of it as timeless wisdom because it's present all the time. It's just, uh, you know, we're not always aware of it, as you say. But then over time and, you know, with the advent of the internet, you can find out anything online, anything. You'd have to go to a bookshop necessarily and there's people all over the place i think i would say you need to find the people that uh you relate to certainly Mm -hmm. and i think you need to look into the quality of the wisdom because the fact that it's available everywhere now and it is a boom i would question sometimes the quality of it uh you know is it coming from someone's deep practice um, or is it just something they've read or they've had an awareness of and then, hey, wow, suddenly they're an expert on it? Um, <laughs> I would question that. And the way to actually decide whether it's valid or not is in your own experience because really in the end that's the the real proof. And, you know, people want to know if it's valid before they try it. The only way is to try it. You know, if you want to know, try being present for five minutes. I, I challenge you, try staying present with what you're doing and it could be brushing your teeth, it could be driving without being lost in a whole lot of thoughts. Try that yeah. for five minutes. Try it for one minute and and your experience will indicate how awake you are or not as a general rule and then work from there. And it's about being conscious of it because once you become yeah. conscious of it, then you're conscious that you're when you're not. Yep. That was something for me of of like working and I was driving a truck for a living. And once I knew about mindfulness and being in the moment, being present, and there's so much that we're missing when we're not, you know? And so for me of being a truck driver, I just, I I I knew I had a three hour drive ahead of me, four hour drive. And I just couldn't wait to get from point A to point B. So the drive in between, I wasn't mindful. um, and, uh, and, and, And if I wasn't I mean, I would go full days like that. I would go the whole day just because, like, I'm here. I have to, my my body. Ha- I just have to do a job and do a duty. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I mean, depression can kick in and uh, all this other stuff. But when I was mindful to just, like, be present and in the moment instead of, like, trying to hurry and rush and all of these things, um, yeah. whether I was delivering parts to customers and things like that, it was like, okay, let me just be present with the customers. Let me be present with nature, with scenery of taking all of this in, even though I've seen it m- many times on these routes, being present and, see- and, and seeing it. I was conscious when I wasn't in the moment and it was something fleeting and I would always have to correct it to be in the moment and and, and make sure that I was mindful and the quality of life for me of my mental well-being and in my peace was uh was tremendous than just like being on autopilot is what I call it and then because if we're not careful we forget to turn it off and we just stay there and in weeks days weeks months pass by and we've just been on autopilot and we just like we're not creating uh we're just there we're just doing our duty punching in the clock and things like that yeah, that exactly right. And uh, look, 
there's a certain protection in do, doing our duty and, you know, caring for families and all that. That is very important. But to bring the element of being conscious, as you say, changes everything. And, and conscious, consciousness is the thing that is the most potent. And to bring more of it in and to raise our level of consciousness and awareness comes down to exactly what you say. Turn the radio off when you're driving, okay, and <laughs> actually – Feel the steering wheel, see the the scenery, and even though you 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 think you've seen it, it'll be different every single time. You know, there's there's this sort of incredibly rich variety of life to experience every single moment if we're present to it, mm -hmm. and it's a case of being prepared to be present. and And often it's just easier to check out and go to sleep. Yeah. And as you say, though, then things are running on autopilot. And that's a bit scary because you think, well, what is running on autopilot? You know, what's going on that we're actually completely unaware of? And then we end up with mental health issues, for example. And, um, and that's what comes to the surface when we're not actually present, or it can yeah. do anyway. I find that, you know, some of these things that we're we're talking about, and again, I, I come from the, the Christian tradition of like studying this stuff from the Bible. And once I'm consciously yeah. aware that this is a thing and it's taught by other traditions and then I read the Bible, I'm reading some of the stuff that Jesus taught. He's like, look, be anxious for nothing. You know, yeah. don't worry about anything. You're going to be taken care of. You're going to have food. You're going to have clothing. Look at the lilies of the field, the most beautiful flowers out here. They don't worry about anything. And the, and the father clothes them with, you know, the, 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 the most beautiful raiment out here and, and things like that. And so it became real for me again, like projecting my consciousness outside of myself to, for me, was like at a later time a later yeah. date, becoming anxious. And so even if I had an event coming up, I noticed early on, it was just some kind of frame of, of reference, an event that was coming up that was maybe a month or two out. Every day was spent thinking about that event. And I was like, I yeah. couldn't wait for it. Like I was excited for it and I was anxious for it. And it was causing yeah. me to like miss a lot of other things that was going on around me because my mind was always on this future event that was coming and then mm -hmm. we finally get to the event and it's, uh, you know, we, we have a good time or whatever, but it's like, okay, now what? And it was like this big <laughs> expectation that it's yep. like, it's kind of fleeting. It's like, oh man. And, and I'm able to look back and say, man, now then the next event that comes up is like, oh, there's another event and you find yourself doing this. Like, okay. There's something going on here. I'm being anxious and projecting my, my consciousness outside of you know, this present moment to something that doesn't exist yet, you know, and I'm living in the future and I'm not embracing yeah. the moment. And many of us are, you know, living in the past, you know, we're not, yeah. and, and they, they don't care about the future. They're, they're just, you know, regrets and what ifs and the one that got away and all of these things are just worried about yeah. the past, <clears throat> the past. So, and both of them can be dangerous. There's people who are always in the future. There's people who are always in the in the past, past, but it's about being present and in the now moment and holding on to that and being aware when you're kind of slipping from one to the other. Now, it's, I think it's okay to do a review and think about that stuff, but getting stuck yeah. there is kind of yeah. where, you know, we, we find ourselves running into, into problems. No, absolutely. You know, that, that whole being stuck in, in the past is such a heavy burden. Um, we, we really actually have no idea how heavy that is. It's honestly like having our feet set in concrete or dragging concrete blocks behind us. And to actually let go of the past and, and however that happens to be just let it go. And my teacher used to describe the action is like this to that. Mm. Okay, just letting it go. And it, it comes up again. Let it go. And you can only do that in the present. You can't let go in the future or the past. <laughs> you can only do it in the present. Yeah. And the effort to stay in the present really is the same effort that it takes to put your head, uh, to keep your head on the pillow in bed at night. It's a resting, yeah. keeping, letting the mind and the attention rest. And then it goes off, bring it back. And it goes off, bring it back. And it's a bit like training a, a sort of a naughty little puppy, you know, eventually eventually it settles. And, that, and that's also one of the beauties of meditation. 
in whatever form you practice, it's bringing the attention back. But you can practice that when you're cleaning your teeth or driving or washing the dishes or mm -hmm. doing anything practical. And, and it's fantastic to bring it into everyday life like that rather than just I meditate and then I get up and I go back into all my thoughts again. No, bring that with you and stay present whilst you're doing all these actions and you'll discover a whole new richness and aliveness in doing all these simple things. And you can start letting go of the past and healing all of that. And you're disinclined to then leap forward into the future. And as you describe, with all of that comes this unhealthy relationship with the future, which then brings about a lot of anxiety mm -hmm. about what if, you know. <laughs> Yeah, the what ifs in the future, and then like there's a lot of study now about the past, the past, and um, like with trauma, like people being stuck in the past because of trauma, and even being stuck at a certain age of like learning or character yeah. development because you were 14 years old when this happened to you, or you lost your parent or your loved one, or the yeah. you know you heard something that was just you know traumatic to you, and people are, and I, I feel like trauma keeps us stuck in the past as well and so there's a lot of people doing uh the healing work and i think that any spiritual work is healing work i think that being conscious yeah. and mindful and meditation it all it deals with healing and, and being able to look at ourselves um objectively to make sure we don't have any anything that's you know um anchoring us to any false identities or, or bad you know habits that we're doing because of something that happened in the past are you helping people with that or like finding that trauma we have to like deal with that trauma or let it go or heal from it in in order to be present and in the moment mm, uh, look i do uh, and <clears throat> coaching is the coach modality is a bit different from counseling and therapy because yeah. <clears throat> therapy and counseling does specifically go back to those areas and uh -huh. and help release them. Um, coaching's about here we are now moving forward, as okay. it were, in the present. But that said, when there's things that are still unresolved, um, I do help clients with that. And there's this powerful but simple ways of just getting the awareness back to where the, as you say, being still anchored in some way to something in the past, just getting some awareness around it and then doing something like even writing a letter to yourself saying, it's okay, I'm ready to be free of this now, I'm ready to let go, um, I've learnt the lesson, uh, I'm grateful for the experience as hard as it was, I'm grateful for it, and, but I'm ready to let it go now because who I am now is ready to move forward. <clears throat> and that often helps a client um, connect with who they are now rather than, as you say, be like something that happened when they were a teenager or happened 10 years ago, to be where they are now and embrace who they are now. And once yeah. they do that, then they can let go. Yeah. I'm glad you made that distinction. I haven't, I've never heard that. I've <laughs> always kind of lumped them in together. Like a coach, you know, yeah. it's so, I, I thought it was all the same, you know, but, I, no. I, you know, I do like that distinction. A coach is someone who's helping you where you are now moving forward versus a counselor is kind of dealing with the past and uh, mm. in, in the future maybe Very, even. But yeah, but yeah the, the dealing with the now moment is, is, is big and that's what you specialize in. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if people want to find out more about your work, they want to they want to get your book, uh, book a private session with you, all of the cool things that you have to offer on your website. It's really cool. You got a lot of stuff on there. Where's the best place for somebody to go to check out your work? On my website. <laughs> it's ConsciousConfidence.com. So I hope you can spell that. It's ConsciousConfidence.com. As you say, it's got everything there. You can get my book. My book's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or via my website, which will just take you through there. Um, and my book's got a lot of practical tips in it. So don't be put off thinking it's all Sanskrit and I've got to learn some. No, no, no. Yeah. There's, there's stories in there. There's traditional teaching stories which are simple and the message is clear in them. There's accounts of actual people that I've worked with, kids that I've taught um, that give examples of what I'm talking about. Plus there's some new knowledge in the Sanskrit that, might help you. You don't have to learn Sanskrit. You don't need to read it or speak about it. It's just the knowledge that's in there. Um, and there's practices, simple things you can put into practice in your everyday life. You don't have to go anywhere special to do them. 
um, and you will experience the transformation. So my website, ConsciousConfidence.com, and I also have a monthly podcast talking about all of this as well, and that's all on my website. Yeah, that's what I ask you about the podcast as well. Yeah, make sure you guys go there, check it out, check out our book. It's really cool. Uh, and there's, again, the, uh, what I really do like is the, the practices in here too, where people can actually engage in it uh, for themselves. Thanks so much for hanging out. What time is it there now? It's nearly quarter past four in the morning a.m. <laughs> are, you staying, are you staying up or getting some sleep? Um, I might stay up for a bit. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it, my friend. I'll see. It's lovely to talk to you. I enjoyed you. it so much. Thanks for hanging out with me. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank we'll you. Have to do it again. Thank you for yeah. Definitely. Thanks. All right. Bye bye. Bye. Sarah Main, ladies and gentlemen. Conscious confidence. You gotta be you have to uh be confident in the moment. You have to be conscious and in the moment. Um really, really good stuff. And I, I really like the I like I really think I could rename this podcast to be the syncretism podcast because it's just finding the, 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 the veins that are the same and what links us together. I mean, I'm very well um, studied on the Hebrew and the Hebraic roots movement and, the, and the engaging with the, uh, the language and stuff like that. And so it's really and, and some of the, the, the beliefs that, you know, our language is older. No, our language is older. All of these kind of things. Um, but it's interesting to, to note that, you know, it's very similar to both schools of thought, the Hebrew and the Sanskrit. And for, I think they're both magical languages. Again, a lot of people who study the Sanskrit and study Hebrew, they just kind of throw English to the side. Oh, English is just a combination of, of them all. You're right. But... It's a very magical language. It wasn't just a, it wasn't just a weird combination of them all. It's a very magical language. It's a, there's the, with the the spelling of words of creating spells with your words to, um, as you write something, you're performing a magical rite. You can write in cursive, and you're performing curses, and you know the different. Uh, meanings and double entendres of words. We think we're saying one thing, but it really means another on a magical, energetic language uh, and really understanding that. So English is, is a powerful language too, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, it's the, the, the compilation of all the languages and almost like picking a lot of the best parts from a lot of them, simplifying it, but very magical at the same time. Um, I, I know a lot of people who are, are scholars in, in Hebrew and, and even in Sanskrit and stuff. And I think that they're both uh, beautiful languages to engage and magical in that ancient vibration, the ancient tongue. I mean, again, I was talking about we did some of the uh, the Sanskrit chanting this past weekend at our men's conference and uh, it was powerful. But we also did some hebraic chanting as well and it was just as powerful so just engaging with the with, with the ancient language and um is something to it and again i really do think that beyond the language is the vibration is the uh what would you call it um the sacred geometry geometric patterns of of tones and vibrations and and frequencies that is behind sound ideas thoughts or frequencies and uh and I think that's the universal language. I think that when we go into to meditation and really deep levels, people are able to kind of see these uh, beautiful forms of sacred geometry, whether it's through people are talking about ayahuasca or psilocybin or something, being able to see cogs and shapes and things that are just moving. And I really think that we're engaging with vibration when we do that. It's really interesting. Um, I really enjoyed this podcast. Good talk. One thing I was thinking about, I heard this morning, you guys know that uh, I, I've talked about it in my book, but cancel culture, right? The scapegoat thing that we always want to blame people and point the fingers. And, it's, and I wrote about the thing where like, um, what's his name? Um, the, the YouTuber, uh, Logan Paul, 
how he messed up and people are like waiting for him to mess up so they can throw him under the bus, right? He messed up and there's blogs and everybody's canceling him and the ad revenue people are like dropping him and these endorsement deals are dropping him because he filmed a dead body that he found in the uh, Japanese forest, right? So he was canceled by a lot of, he had to kind of work his way back. Look at, you know, a, a very prime example for me is um, um, Roseanne Barr, who woke up in, in, in ambient-induced, alcohol-infused sleep, woke up and, and tweeted in the middle of the night, supposedly, uh, and made a racist comment on Twitter, woke up the next morning, and she was getting calls from uh, agents and, and advertising companies saying, hey, we can't work with you no more. Hey, you're not, we, you know, your services are no longer needed. We've canceled you because you've offended us. Um I woke up this morning to hear about Ari Shafir, Joe Rogan's homeboy, who uh, was just canceled last night. Uh, had a full tour speaking. He's a com- stand-up comedian and uh, very he's very controversial in nature anyway. And so his 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 I don't think his, any of his um, um, routines have ever been like either either PG or, or wholesome or anything like that. It's always been below the belt vulgar comedy making fun of racism i think he did a uh he had one skit where he put um he was standing out by a a ship trying to get black people to board the ship to go back to africa and he's like trying to lure black people in to ship them back to africa you know so it's like hold on and he he gets canceled overnight all of his stuff has been like that um so there was a tweet that he did and he pretty much said that uh, making fun of Kobe Bryant, Kobe Bryant's death. And he was trying to say that um, um, it was a good thing that Kobe Bryant passed away because he was someone who got away with rape. Now, I can see the point he was trying to make. He was saying that Kobe Bryant got away with rape and uh, and it's a good thing that he's passed on now because because of that. And um and uh, you know, he he was making fun of Kobe, but still trying to prove a point, right? There was some kind of like, it was satire, but there was something um, behind it. Um, and he woke up, and well, not woke up, but even that night, they we got a bunch of threats that people were gonna like shoot up the club that he was performing in, and all of his all of his um his dates got canceled. He had to cancel all of his dates because of that tweet, making fun of Kobe's death. Um, to try to to try to prove a point uh, for the sake of comedy. But then he uh, he followed it up with another tweet or Instagram post. And I tried to go to his Twitter this morning. He made his Twitter private. He pretty much shut his Twitter down. He's got all these people outraged for doing that. And uh, man, cancel culture. We look at Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart did a tweet over 10 years ago. And he was... Uh, going to host I believe it's the Oscars or whatever Emmy is one of them he was going to host it and then somebody dug up a tweet that he did 10 years ago and shared it out with a couple news places and it went viral and then they asked him to step down or, or apologize for these tweets that he made uh um 10 years ago and so he he refused to apologize and then he did apologize and they, it wasn't good enough and all of that kind of stuff. Someone here, Tom Traveler Montgomery and a couple other people have been talking about, did they said, did they block Jordan Peterson because he talked about psilocybin and pharmaceutical Masonics? Where did they block him at? Cause he's definitely on Twitter. I, Cause I actually Googled this why the first time you posted it about Jordan Peterson, where is he blocked at? He's definitely still on Twitter. Is he, is he on, um, uh, did they block him on YouTube or, or where? I mean, I really do. I like a lot of you know, Jordan Peterson. He's still on. He's still on YouTube. I like a lot of his stuff. Where where was he blocked at? But they will. I mean, you say one one wrong thing that they don't like, they're gonna pull your card. You know, looking at um, you know, uh, Alex Jones being one of the f- kind of first forerunners of of you know, free thought or whatever the case is and just being uh, freedom of speech. But you you have freedom of speech until you piss people off or you have, you know, 
they pulled him from every platform and, and people are trying to re-upload his stuff. But looking at some of the stuff that guy was talking about, even though it's far out, what way out there on a lot of conspiracy theories, um, he was right about a lot of them, too. The Epstein thing, he was right about that. Cancel culture is very strange. You're one tweet away from being shut down and, and being canceled. And so people will try to get you to uh, to uh, they'll try to get you to respond to some of these controversial topics so that they because whether they're your enemies or they want to see you down on their level, knocked off of your high horse and, you know, all that kind of thing. Misery loves company. It's just a thing, man. It's part of it. Um, so Tom Traveler says uh, censoring. They don't want people to know about the real medicine, psilocybin. Oh, he's out there, but they suppress his information. Yeah. On, on all of those guys, man. Um, free thought. Uh, the psilocybin thing is getting out there regardless. There's no way to stop it. There's too many people that's awake and uh, there's too much research out there now that it's becoming mainstream. I even seen this morning a friend of mine posted an article that they uh, just legalized psilocybin in um, some state. What state was that he posted? Let me see. This is my friend Ja posted. Uh, ja Love. Let's see. He posted... Uh, article that said breaking Santa Cruz decriminalizes all uh, entheogenic uh, plants and fungi so it's actually you can't stop it you know and everybody's having a conversation so once enough people wake up it just kind of catches on and again I think the medical community's helping to uh, decriminalize it and do the proper research on it too so that's really cool I like your work because you talked about talked about real issues, but they also censored a lot of music. Uh, for sure, I'm definitely getting censored, man. It's uh, it's not cool. You can type in the names of my song. You can type in True Seeker the way I spell it. You can type in the name of the song, and there and it's not gonna come up. Something different's gonna come up with a lot of my stuff. I don't know if the videos are too old. I don't know if it's, you know, if I'm when they they did a they did a censoring and changed the algorithms and stuff and it was talking about like almost blacklisting any type of alternative thought or conspiracy theory stuff i try to stay away from the conspiracy stuff because most of it's not really healthy again the, the, dealing with the different theories right versus things that you can prove and things that can help you become a better person be a better father be a better friend you know what i'm saying and uh be a better husband like those are the things that i'm interested in for myself and so conspiracy theories and and endless rabbit trails they don't work for me um after the fact that i know that again there's a lot of wicked people in in, in darkness that's behind hollywood and, and behind um a lot of the stuff that we see in mainstream media like once i've like done my own personal research and have went down the conspiracy rabbit holes. There's, there's nothing that shocks me anymore. And I, I get, uh, I get messages all the time from supporters and from friends who are wanting me to really get into some of the conspiracy theory stuff. And I'm like, I'm not, not doing it. I'm sorry. There's a, there's a plethora, a whole plethora of YouTube channels and podcasts who would love to entertain the thoughts of some of this, uh, weird controversial, um, conspiracy theories out there. I'm not doing it. I've done it, you know, in the past, but, um, that's, it's not my, it's not my thing. Uh, so stop with that. All those messages and people want me to, to look into it or to, to talk about it and, and kind of, it's almost like a forceful thing. One dude, and it's kind of weird, but I don't know if he knows what he said, but he, he was kind of disrespectful he was saying that um, if I don't talk about it, maybe I'm controlled opposition, and that's the that's right there. Like you are you in, you in too deep, bro. You're in too deep to 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 be throwing those words around like that um, to address a, a conspiracy theory that I don't think we could ever get to the bottom of unless we were there. You know what I'm saying? That some of these things are just theories, and that's what they're going to be. But uh, I try to deal with truth, man. I try to deal with things that we can apply to our life on a daily basis, help us to become better people, uh, manifest the things that we want in life to en enjoy this existence, make it a little bit easier as well for some people who are having a hard time. Uh, conspiracy theories um, really birth a lot of paranoia. 
People are always on edge. You're always thinking that people are out to get you. You think that um, everyone's lying to you. You think that everything is a cover up. You think that everybody who dies that's a celebrity was outed by the Illuminati. You know, all kind of weird stuff. People making a lot of crazy claims about uh, um, Kobe Bryant's death being an Illuminati ritual and sacrifice, all kind of stuff. Um, I, I posted that even that, that helicopter video of the cartoon. I thought that was strange. But um, it's one of those things that you find what you're looking for. You start connecting dots that aren't there, right? So there was a, you know, a video. The, the video is strange. I'll give you that. Very, very strange um, of the, the accident or whatever. The, the helicopter crashed in a cartoon and it was Kobe and they, he was asking for help. But they were like, give us the trophies or something. And the plane blows up and he ends up going out that way. And then so just because of that and maybe some other stuff people see, they think that it was an Illuminati plot or whatever the case is. Go back over all the other commercials that are that are strange or the different jabs that were taken about Kobe. I'm sure there's a lot more. And what if he would have uh, passed another way, you know, and then we would have made those connections too. you start making connections that aren't there, but they're, they're there for you. And um, it's uh, you never get to the bottom of it, man. There's a lot of fear, a lot of hysteria there. And and I'm not saying it's not exciting. They're fun. You know, it's fun to uh, to get to the bottom of it or even prove it. Wrong. But then then we've already seen it. What happens when you prove it? What are you going to do? The, the guy was telling me and, and I'm not going to say his name, but because I, you know, but he was saying, like, if we if we expose that, that the Illuminati is doing this, then we'll have a we'll win people over to Christ. Like what? No, you don't win people over to Christ by talking about what the enemy is doing, like exposing the enemy because they they. The Bible says that they keep coming up with with new ideas and different ways to manipulate people in different uh, ways to be lewd and, and all this kind of stuff. There's never going to be an end to that with these people. So just focus in on what they're doing. That's why you can't focus on what you want to do with your life because you're too busy focus, focusing on these people, the conspiracy stuff. And people will get hungry for it, man. You know, I interviewed um, um, uh, Teresa Yanaros and... Um, you know, she went into a lot of detail about knowing these people who were in the truth movement and disclosure projects. And she's seen people and partnered with people and worked with people who have created conspiracy theories that have blew up, can cre created ideas that have almost turned into religions and have gotten paid off of it, fat paid. And there's a lot of that stuff going on out there to divert you from the things that really matter life family friends you freaking out worried about the new world order and seeing the signs that aren't there and all that kind of stuff and so that's def definitely not um how i want to spend my time but if that's how you want to do it more power to you there's a market there for you you know there's definitely a market there um chris says uh chris garner says most of the woke theorists went past woke straight to daydreaming yeah man they're just they're caught up in it, connecting things. And, and again, like, so again, he's, this person said that if, if we expose this particular Illuminati agenda, then it would win people to Christ. That's no, the gospel wins people to Christ. Illuminati agenda don't win nobody to Christ. And even exposing it, what's it going to do? They're, they laugh at you. They laugh at you. Like they did it. The, they did the same thing with the Epstein thing again. Everyone knows about Epstein. And what have we done? Nothing. Diverted. It. Everyone knows about it. I mean, it's a, it's a, the, one of the biggest conspiracy theories that came out to be true. Came out to be true. And then what are you going to do? Are you going to overthrow the government? Are we getting the pedophiles out? No. They, you know, they all part, part of it, man. So to think that you're going to be some kind of righteous warrior of calling them out and pointing fingers and, and, and change the world. No, you're just focusing on your on, on wickedness and evil and magnifying it, really. So, you know, you only got 24 hours in a day, man. Just pick pick how you're going to spend it. And hopefully it's uh, uplifting people, building people up. Really, there was a scripture on uh, in, in the script in the Bible that um, really helped me out. And I, I've talked about it a lot. Manly P. Hall has a book. That's titled this, but um, 
Let me see. I'm a King James Version. Philippians 4, 8. This this really helped me come clean of and come out of a lot of weird rabbit hole conspiracy theory stuff that I was stuck in. It wasn't just studying. I was stuck in this stuff. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Think about them. Entertain it in your mind, your imagination. When you're trying to go to bed, like your subconscious, we've been talking with the whole subconscious for an hour, training the subconscious. It's working against you. Why? Because you're always thinking of the opposite of these things. Conspiracy theorists, you think about the opposite of these things. Why? Let me, for this to be true, the opposite has to be true. And I think it really does exp- it describe conspiracy theorists. For this to be true, the opposite has to be true as well. And I think it describes conspiracy theories. Theorist. Philippians 4, 8. Let's read it the opposite way. Just entertain it. Finally, brethren, and I'm going to change these words to, to mean the opposite. And tell me if it describes conspiracy theorists. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. What's the opposite of true? False. What do conspiracy theories theorists love to talk about? False flags, bro. It's a false flag. It wasn't real. Whatsoever things are false, false flags. Whatsoever things are honest, what's the opposite of honest? Liars, lies. Who do they focus on? Government lies. They're lying to you, bro. Look it up. Look into it. They're lying to you. Whatsoever things are not honest, but are lies. Come on now. Whatsoever things are just, what is the um, opposite of just? So the opposite of just would be unjust or uh, in- injustice. What do they focus on? No justice, no peace. They focus on injustice. Like this is their message is injustice and dealing with that and pointing it out, right? And glorifying it or or having it always. And for for them, and just, and I'm going to, you know, I got to, they're, do, they're doing it thinking that they're, they really have no solution. They they focus on the negative. And they don't have a solution, because if that was the case, they would they would be the solution. They would do the solution, right? It would catch on, because it would help people. Whatsoever things are pure, what do they focus on? In, what's opposite of in, pure? Impure. Focus on the the corrupt things that government is doing. The impure things that. Is going on in the world that we don't know about and they want to tell you about them you don't even know about this stuff and they tell you about it it's like man why you told me this bro i didn't want to trying to put that in my mind thinking about it i'm trying to wake you up man whatsoever things are lovely what's the opposite of lovely hateful thinking about the hate you know all of this stuff it totally applies whatsoever things are of good report no they're gonna tell you the bad report Tell you the bad stuff that's happening. And I'm not talking about just, just turning a, a blind eye to this stuff, right? Can just all of this stuff is, is real. There's levels to this. But it's when, when that becomes your message. When 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 bad reports become your message. It's like the news. Most of the time we can't even watch the news anymore. It's all bad stuff. It's all negative stuff. It's all so and so got robbed. So and so, you know, escaped the police. So and so was shot. Three kids were shot. Like it's like you know, this stuff is happening whether you report on it or not. You have to be the solution. You have to provide a way out. Um, if there be any virtue, what's the opposite of virtue? Um, you know, n- not having any virtuous, not being virtuous, you know. If there be any praise, if there be anything that's not worthy of talking about, think on these things or talk about these things I, t- I feel like that's what conspiracy theories are doing conspiracy conspiracy theorists are doing because um, i used to do it totally i got into a lot of this stuff through the conspiracy research 
but it came to, down to, I mean, I was, I was even doing the opposite of that stuff, like to the church realm of like the church doctrine stuff of like exposing false teachers and looking for the evil that everyone's doing. I got really good at seeing the evil that I, I, I had no idea even how to teach the, the truth because I was too busy teaching you on the, the bad stuff and exposing the bad stuff. And I became known for that. The, the guy who looks for the bad stuff, the watchman on the wall who's blowing the trumpet. There's a reason the scriptures say this. And, and for me, the revelation was really reading this scripture really helped me. But it was like, listen, if you want to combat conspiracy theorists, if you want to combat the elite government, if you want to combat false doctrine that's going on in the church and false religions, teach it the right way. Simply find out the truth and teach it. You don't have to name call. You don't have to finger point. You don't have to scare people. Simply teach the truth and the truth will overshadow the lies. It will overshadow the darkness. It will illuminate the darkness. The darkness is just the, is not a thing. The darkness is just because there's an absence of light. And when the light, when, when the light's there, there is no darkness. So you carry the light. You are the light of the world. Why are you the bearer of bad news? You're supposed to be the one who's carrying the light, illuminating people. I don't know who that's for, but I've definitely been getting the inboxes and people trying to get me to look up all of this crazy um, conspiracy theory stuff recently. And I'm not, you know, I, I hate it, you know. But again, if <laughs> different things wake wake different people up, man. Ellie says, uh, newsroom rules. If it bleeds, it leads. That's true. Um, Tom Traveler says uh, I'm more into the Illuminati loving and caring about the other people not the conspiracy part of it of life every rabbit hole has a song to it Illuminati Congo yeah that's the Illuminati I'm into the Illuminati Congo the uh, the uh, illuminated with the light the light of Christ Chris Garner says I was stuck in it too for a long time Time Traveler says, I love the med meditation. Fear mongering. Yeah, fear mongering. We've heard it called fear porn. It sells. It's more popular. I don't know why, but it is. So, something to it. Anyway, with that, I'm going to say peace and shalom, man. Again, I'm going to read the scripture one more time. I'm going to end with this. Just reiterate. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. There's a reason why this is in the scriptures. There's a reason why, because the opposite is detrimental to your mental state, to your peace. It, it robs you of your peace. It robs you of your joy. And, uh, you know. And it it serves its purpose. People wake up. People start there. Most of us were there at some point. Now we have a contrast of what it's like to be conspiracy theorist versus truth seeker, right? Where we are. And you find yourself uh, in in those boats and in different parts of your life and different points. And because, um, I mean, I think a lot of those conspiracy theorists think they're truth seekers. Seeking the truth on it, man. This child sex act this, all this stuff is demonic you know it is but they're going to keep coming up with ways you will you will always have a job because they're going to continue coming up with ways to be wicked they're going to continue to come up with ways to be evil you'll be busy for the rest of your life chasing these devils that's not what we're meant to do here with that i'm gonna say peace and shalom man if you haven't checked out my patreon and the work that i bring into the table check it out i've got another meditation i'm working on now it's a simple Bible affirmation. It's an I am uh, affirmation. And so some of the uh, it's 15 different I am's that are really powerful and have helped me to get past some of these ungodly beliefs and and understanding who what who the scriptures say we are, that we are the righteousness of God, that we are set free. We are uh, at peace. We are loved. We are free. You know, uh, there's a 15 of them that I'm putting together as a, as a mantra, as a guided meditation, as an affirmation for you to listen to. If you want to get access to that, it'll be on my Patreon. 
Um, you can also check out what I'm bringing to the table too with the meditations there at Christian dash meditations.com Christian dash meditations.com. <clears throat> Those are some of the biblical affirmations that I have. You can just set them on and play them. There's testimonies of people who are listening to them every morning and, and finding a change, just random people who I don't even, they're not even connected. They found the meditations. They've been listening to them every, every morning and it's changing their lives. And for me, I was, uh, as I'm recording these meditations, I'm having spiritual experience. I'm speaking the word over myself. I'm re reiterating these truths about who I really am and, and, and knowing that my identity is hidden, but it is found in the person of Christ. And the, the, the scriptures are a, a very beautiful way to unlock the beauty of who we really are, because as we read the scriptures, as we behold them, it's like we're re looking into a mirror. We're reading a book that tells us this beautiful song and dance of the journey of the soul and it's telling our story. So to unlock that of, of finding out who God says you are, the beautiful things, forget who the enemy says you are, forget who your mom says you are, forget who, who you know, your, your doubters and your naysayers say you are. Understand who God says you are and repeat that. Believe that report for once. Watch what happens. It'll change your life. With that, I'm going to say peace and shalom. Christian-meditations.com. Check it out. Yo, so much higher than mine, so much higher than mine, You're so much deeper than mine, so much deeper than mine. Well, that does it for this episode, folks. To hear more episodes of the Truth Seeker podcast, head over to truthseeker.com. And if you're wanting to support the show and get rewards, go to our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash truthseeker.